I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Afternoon. Welcome to church at which meets here at Malden. We're glad each one of you here with us tonight. I see no visitors. <clears throat> I hope each one of you picked up a bulletin today. I hope you look over the things in the bulletin. Just remember all our shut ins that's in the bulletin are sick. Also, it's had our Deborah Clark. She's at home recovering. So let's uh, keep her in our prayers, hoping she will. Uh, be back with us very soon. Also, I know Vernon's been sick, so let's remember him also. Uh, and Diana Firecloud, she was her knee. I forgot exactly. She uh, she went to the doctor, and they told her to stay off of it, trying to see if they can get it to heal. It swelled real bad, so let's remember her also. And also, uh, Allison Burkhart, uh, let's remember her. She's recovering from COVID. It's good to see Joe with us here tonight. I told him I'm going to give him a pair of boxing gloves so I'll protect them hands. <laughs> so he won't, he won't be hit, bumming them up no more. Uh, the personal work group meeting will be after services tonight. So anyone can stay and help with that would be greatly appreciated. And also next Saturday afternoon, the soup and game night. And it will start at 4 o'clock. So I hope each one of you can come out and participate in that and enjoy the fellowship with each other. Into our service tonight, our song leader will be Joel Foster, a lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Rusty Maddox, and Joel Foster will begin our service with open. Father in heaven, we approach your throne this evening once again with thanksgiving for this opportunity to be together and assemble once again with the brethren, to fellowship of one another and to teach one another. We pray that you will continue to bless us, that you will continue to bless this congregation. We ask, Father, that you will help us to be shining examples, shining lights in your community. Father, we know that we fail so often as humans. We ask for your forgiveness for these failures. Often we don't even realize the failures that we, that we do. We pray for your forgiveness in all these things. Father, we are praying especially tonight for those that are sick, that are recovering, the ones that Brother Dale has mentioned, others that we may not know. <clears throat> we pray that you would offer your healing hand if it is your will, that you would be with the doctors, the nurses, the medical personnel that work with these folks that are struggling. And if it is your will, we pray that they, you'll grant them a good measure of health once again. We pray your comfort and healing upon them in the meantime. Father, we ask for your blessings upon the, our first responders, upon our military, upon our leaders, 
pray that you would keep them from harm, that you would keep them from deviating from the things that you would have them to do. We pray that each of us will be obedient to the things that come down as long as they are in accordance with your word. But we pray, Father, that you be with each of us, that if the time does come that we are told that we can no longer teach, that we can no longer present the true gospel truth, that we will understand just as Peter and the others that we ought to obey you rather than man. We're thankful for Brother Dennis and his family that work with this congregation. We pray that you be with him tonight as he presents us a lesson that we will take those things and keep them in our minds, understand the study that we are being presented this evening, that we will investigate those things that we do not understand. Father, we pray now that you'd be with us in this worship service. We pray that you will be glorified by our worship, that you will accept this worship, and that we will be uplifted for having been here. For those that were not able to be here this morning, we're thankful that they're with us tonight and that they would be uplifted as well. In all things, <coughs> Father, your will be done. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Three, seven. Three, seven. strength when we're weary 
a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. When I look up to the heavens and I see the rainbow's beauty and the stars shining brightly in the sky, I see a joy never-ending and a love everlasting. We can live every day in God's true light. When I look back to the garden and I see the Savior praying for a bond that would make his people strong, I know that God heard his praying and he answered at Calvary. Jesus died so that we could sing this song. Our hymn of encouragement, 189. 189, following Brother Dennis' lesson. Before the lesson, 446. 446. To love someone more dearly every day, to help a wandering child to find his way. all of you that come out tonight. I really do. Job chapter 36 verses 8 through 11 it reads, But if they are bound in chains and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their works and their transgressions. 
that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruction, commands that they return from iniquity. And if they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness. If there is one thing in our nation and in our world today that has a pronounced lack of, it is discipline. Ask any school teacher, they can tell you what they deal with on a daily basis. You see, discipline or the lack of goes all the way from the home all the way up to our government. And that lack of discipline affects everyone. And when that lack of discipline affects the world, it eventually makes its way into the Lord's church. But we know that this disregard of authority had its beginnings in the garden. Eve had disregarded Adam authority. Adam had disregarded God's authority and the two of them allowed sin to enter into this world. It wasn't but a few generations later on that we read in Genesis chapter 6 that all but eight people in this whole world disregarded God's authority. And those consequences destroyed the world. Discipline is training that corrects. It molds, it strengthens, and it perfects. But discipline is also punishment and chastisement. There are those of us that remember the bygone years how the church itself had stood on discipline. But over these last decades, we can see in a lot of congregations and where they have gone soft. Churches don't want to offend anyone, least of all the offender themselves. They don't want the, per the perception that they are unloving. But we are failing our brothers and sisters in Christ when we lack discipline. And when we fail them, we also fail God. At times it seems that we're caught between the rock and a hard place. But when we are between that rock and a hard place, we need to ask ourselves the question of who we are trying to please. We're trying to please one another. We're trying to please God. We need to look at discipline from a scriptural standpoint. We need to understand what God has to say about it. And then when everything is said and done, we need to ask ourselves who we are trying to please. Now, as I said in the very first part there, that the definition of discipline is preventative in nature. It's a teaching that corrects and molds and strengthens and perfects. It's the kind of discipline uh, that's needed to be used all the time. In this way, we teach those things that are necessary in order to prevent the breaking down of God's commandments. We teach our children when they're old enough to understand to obey our instructions. And this kind of instruction is foremost in bringing up our children as, as Ephesians 6 and verse 4 in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now there is no evidence whatsoever that the Christians in Rome were breaking civil laws. And yet Paul had written to them concerning the powers that be in Rome in Romans chapter 3 and the first two verses. Let every person be subject to the governing authority. For there is no authority except from God, and those exist have been instituted by God, and what God has appointed and those who resist will occur judgment. 
those instructions continue on down to verse 7. It's preventative in nature. He's simply giving instruction to the brothers and sisters in Rome and how to conduct themselves towards the civil governments. It is still applicable today. As in Joel's prayer that he gave just a moment ago, that we obey the laws of this nation except when they come in conflict with God's commands. But Paul also used this kind of discipline in the book of Galatians. In his letter there, in verses 19 and 21 of chapter 5, he listed all of these things that would cause one to lose their inheritance in the kingdom of God. And while I'm sure that some of those things were being done by the brethren there, Paul was showing them that if they continue or if they do those things, that they would be unable to enter God's kingdom. And Paul also had provided the instructions to Timothy. But in 1 Timothy 4, in the first six verses, Paul doesn't call it discipline. But it is discipline in the strictest sense of the word. Where he writes here, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared, who forbid marriage, require abstinence from food that God required to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. And if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ being trained in words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Of course, some of those words that Paul said had fallen on deaf ears because it wasn't but two centuries later that they started instituting some of these very things. Paul here is telling Timothy what is going to happen. He tells them then to put in the brethren's mind so that they will be able to resist it. And hopefully these churches will be able to prevent it from going down a very destructive path. And I apologize to Joe. I didn't realize how difficult this lesson would be to try to find songs that fit with the lesson. And there isn't a discipline issue in this congregation, but it does need to continue to be taught from time to time. So if we're thinking, I wonder who he's talking about, I'm not talking about anybody. I'm just giving us a bit of God's word. Because we come down to the corrective discipline. It is that punishment and chastisement part of discipline. It's the hardest part, really, of when we do have to provide discipline. And we can't get away from the idea that corrective discipline is punishment regardless of of how obnoxious the idea may seem in the religious realm. It seems that in every other aspect of life, we are comfortable with corrective discipline. But when it comes down to the church, we shy away. You know, we punish our children when they misbehave. Or maybe we should. We use various degrees of punishment to fit the situation. Even our own government has varying degrees of punishment according to the seriousness of crime. Since the beginning of man's existence, God has handed out punishment. He handed out punishment with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. He handed out punishment in Genesis 6 and 7. Numbers 13, he punished Israel. Their unbelief of even going into the land of kingdom brought serious problems to them. 2 Timothy 3 and verses 16 and 17, 
Paul reminds us that all scripture is inspired. And it is for teaching, reproof, correction, and instruction. It is that word and that word only that is eternal. It never ceases. It never loses its effectiveness. And it never, ever, ever loses its authority. People don't like to be judged. People make it a point to tell us that we can't. But it is Paul that tells us in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 12 that we are to judge those who are within the Lord's church. But it is God that judges those who are without. In John 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, The one that rejects me does, does not receive my words as a judge. And the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And that is basically the same principle that Paul gives us in Galatians 6 and verses 7 and 8. For whatsoever one sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap the flesh, will reap from the flesh corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And that principle does not only apply to those things that are eternal, but they also apply to those things of this life. If we do wrong on this earth, we can expect to receive the punishment for the wrong that we have done. Paul said in Colossians 3 and verses 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. God is not a respecter of persons. We can never, ever buy influence in heaven. But the Bible tells us that we must discipline ourselves. And Jesus gives us the instructions to do just that in Matthew chapter 18. Verses 15 through 17, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two with you. That every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, Take it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. That is harsh, but it's something that needs to be done. But as with most churches, when we have an issue with somebody, we go to somebody else to intervene to take care of it. Sometimes, if we know the outcome of that person going to the other person, it's better thought to take another person with you to keep things civil and on track. And Paul in Romans 16 and verse 7, he told the brethren that if someone is causing division, if they cause some stumbling to going on and that goes against God's word, that they are to turn away from them. He gives a warning to those in Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians 6, and also in verses 14 and 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from a brother who is walking in idleness and not in the tradition which you have received from us. And if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. Have nothing to do with him, that he might be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. You see, we're in this misconception that when we turn someone out from the church is that we're to never have anything whatsoever to do with them, that they are no longer welcome inside these doors, and that cannot be further from the truth. Someone's heart can always change. but we don't spend our social time with them. That loneliness that they feel is corrected also in nature. They will miss what they have. 1 
1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 4 and 5. Paul said that those who will not repent must be, be delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 13, he commands that the wicked man be put away from, from everyone. These things are not done to condemn one soul. It's to help them realize that we will not tolerate the things that they do and that we will not keep silent, which is also a sign of approval. What would happen if we don't correct our children when they do wrong? Eventually they're going to assume that it's okay. We can't deny in the face of these scriptures that uses phrases in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we command or withdraw yourselves that action is authorized and commanded. And since God has furnished us with everything that we need for good works. And since God is Word is still applicable today, just as it was to the church in the first century, just as God's word was applicable to Adam and Eve and on down. That word of God will judge us. And it teaches us also that beyond the shadow of a doubt that the church must practice discipline against those who walk disorderly. We cannot let God down. And we cannot let those who walk disorderly down, but do everything in our powers to bring them back. We have a responsibility to ensure that the Lord's church remains pure. And it doesn't solely rest on one or two or three individuals within the church but on each and every one of us. And it is something that needs to be done correctly. It needs to be done in a proper way. It needs to be done in the proper spirit. And also, and most importantly, it needs to be done in love. When we look after ourselves, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the church, we can have a relationship with one another that is pure and holy. And we must not allow disruptions to that peace that we have as a congregation. If there is anyone here this evening who is subject to the invitation, whether it is to bring yourself into the fold, to accept our Lord and Savior, to enter into his congregation, his church, through repentance, confession, and baptism, have your sins washed away and begin a new life. We want to give you that opportunity. And if anyone else is subject to the invitation, won't you come? Together we stand and we sing. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mouth outpoured, there where the blood of the land was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and clear. Oh
hope we prepare for those who do not have the opportunity to come forward this time. I can deliver it to you at this time. Uh, will you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be able to gather around this table, to partake in this fellowship meeting, to remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, and all that he has done for us. And we ask your blessings on this bread, Lord, that, that we will remember the body that was broken, that was laid and nailed to that cross, of just what your son went through for us. And for that, we are so grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. continue in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so appreciative of the blood that was shed on that cross. And we ask your blessings on this fruit of the vine that represents that blood. And that as we take it, Lord, we take it in a way that is pleasing to you, that our minds and our hearts are focused on that sacrifice. And we are just so grateful for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Basket will be left on the table for those who did not have the opportunity earlier to give. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, it is hard to understand, Lord, how blessed we truly are. We don't always see it. We don't always think about it. But we are blessed beyond imagination. We can take care of ourselves and our families. And you have taken care of us. But you have blessed us with these things, Lord, and you have allowed us to be the caretakers of them. So we pray, Lord, that as we return some of these blessings that you have received to you and to this congregation, to be able to use the furthering the work here in this community and abroad, we pray that you'll accept these gifts and bless them. We're just so grateful, Lord, that we can do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is there anything else? Uh, personal works tonight? I, I didn't know. I didn't hear anyone mention that it was in the bulletin that Ruth and Lanier is having that surgery Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
pray that you'll continue to be with those that are sick, be with those that may be shut in, the folks that's recently had procedures and surgeries, and the folks that's recently had tests. We just pray that you'll be with all of them and pray that much good can come from the surgeries and, and the tests. We pray that the folks that's had tests can get answered. We pray that you'll just continue to be with the doctors and nurses and the caregivers uh, on a daily basis. Give them the strength and wisdom they need to carry out their duties. We pray that you'll continue to be with the folks that protect us on a daily basis, whatever field they may be in. We pray that you'll be with them and be with their families. Just strengthen and comfort and guide them in the only way you know how. We pray that you'll just continue to be with us and we strive to be that example we need to be, whether it be in our, our own homes, workplaces, schools, whatever it may be, just may we strive to, to be that example. We want heaven to be our home in the end. Just continue to be with us as we leave this place and we start our new work week. Just be with us all and forgive us for our sins. For our sin we pray. Amen. 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 Am